Chapter 7 Straight is the Gate Judge not, that ye not be judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Almost everyone has a tendency to gossip, to criticize and judge others. We relish gossiping and criticizing others because it swells our own sense of ego. Behind our pleasure there is the feeling, I don't have this weakness, I am greater than he is. Most often the weaknesses we seem to see in another person exist only in our own impure imagination. How many of us can really look into the depths of another human being and see all the motives which are prompting him to act in a particular way? Yet we are eager to judge and impute motives, evil motives. Gossip may seem very innocent, yet it causes immense harm in human society, and particularly to those who indulge in it. Those who dwell on the faults of others develop the same faults themselves. For in the mind of every individual, both good and bad impressions and tendencies are stored up. And if you criticize another person for a certain fault and go on criticizing, similar tendencies which were dormant in your own subconscious mind are released and become active. If, on the other hand, you make a habit of seeing the good in others, your own good tendencies are released and strengthened. So for his own sake as well as for the sake of others, the spiritual aspirant must not criticize, gossip, or judge. As Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual wife, Sri Sarada Devi said, If you want peace of mind, do not find fault with others. Learn to make the whole world your own. No one is a stranger. This whole world is yours. In India, we have a saying that the fly sits on the filth as well as on the honey, but that the bee seeks only the honey and avoids the filth. And so one of the first vows given to the religious aspirant is, May I follow the example of the bee, not that of the fly. As we progress in spiritual life, we learn to see the good in everyone. We learn to have love, sympathy, and compassion for all. Real holy beings have that attitude toward mankind. If you have the least drop of goodness in you, they see an ocean of goodness within that drop. Not because they are overly optimistic, but because they see the possibility of future growth, and they emphasize it. They know that through the grace of God, a man may be freed in one moment from all sin and bondage. Swami Brahmananda used to say, Heaps of cotton can be burnt with one matchstick. Similarly, one gracious glance from God can wipe out mountains of sins. The man who appears as a sinner today may be a saint tomorrow. Does this mean that we should be blind to one another's faults and never try to correct them? Of course not. Jesus does not say that, but he says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. 
Here in this passage, Jesus is asking us to correct our own defects before we try to correct our brothers. We are hypocrites as long as we rationalize our weaknesses and find them worthy of forgiveness, yet remain unwilling to bear with our brothers' imperfections. When we have cast the beam out of our eyes, when our hearts are purified and we really have love for mankind, then we can tell others where they fail, but not with malicious relish, but with sympathy and compassion. My master, Swami Brahmananda, like all great souls, had moods when he saw no faults in anyone. He saw God everywhere and nothing but God. But at other times he scolded us, thundered at us, and pounded our faults. Afterwards he would say, Do not think you can run away from me because I am apparently so cruel. The mother holds the child and spanks it. The child cries, Mother, and all the while it is in its mother's arms. But until we feel such love ourselves, we have no right to criticize others. Hands off. We will find it more profitable to see the fault in ourselves. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Here Jesus tells his apostles how they are to teach the truth of God. He warns them to discriminate, to preach only to those who are prepared to receive and follow the teaching. We find the parallel passages in the scriptures of Vedanta. In one Upanishad it says, Let the truth of Brahman be taught only to those who obey his law, who are devoted to him, and who are pure in heart. In a similar way, after giving the message of the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Sri Krishna says, You must never tell this holy truth to anyone who lacks self-control and devotion, or who despises his teacher and mocks at me. The real guru or true spiritual teacher does not entrust an exalted precept to an unspiritual man who may misinterpret it, misuse it, or justify his worldly cravings, or ridicule it. There are certain conditions which an individual must meet before he can assimilate religious and spiritual truth. He must have purity, a thirst for divine knowledge, and perseverance. When both the aspirant and his teacher are properly qualified, spiritual life becomes fruitful. The Upanishads tell us that many persons, though they hear of the self, do not understand it, and say, Wonderful is he who speaks of it, intelligent is he who learns of it, blessed is he who, taught by a good teacher, is able to understand it. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, you will give him a serpent. In this passage, Jesus sums up the whole truth of religion. Before the door to the kingdom of God is opened, the spiritual aspirant must have both longing for God and faith. What is faith? It is knowing that when we knock at the door, it will be opened. This faith does not come until we have achieved purity of heart. Lust and passion and fleshly desires 
prevent us from seeing God, who is nevertheless present at all times, everywhere. The more we knock, the more we ask and pray, the more this world will be seen to be a mere appearance, and the reality of God's presence will open to us. True longing for God, the hungering and mourning which Jesus calls blessed, comes only when we are no longer attached to the objects of this world. We must reach a stage of spiritual unfoldment in which, in the words of the psalmist, the soul yearns for divine union, as the heart panteth after the water brooks. A great Hindu mystic longed for the vision of Krishna so desperately that an instant separation from his beloved Lord seemed to him like a thousand years. He felt that his heart would burn away with its desire and that the world without God was a heartless void. When this intensity of longing arises, God grants the prayer of his devotee. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? We must always remember that God loves us, who are his own children, and that we have a right to his indulgence. The Saint Ramakrishna said, If a son begs continuously for his share of the property, his parents will give it to him even before he comes of age. So the Lord will surely answer your prayers if you feel restless for him. He is our own father and mother. We have every right to claim our inheritance from him. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. The truth which Jesus teaches here is common to all the major religions. It is the golden rule, our guide for our conduct in human society. There are almost identical passages in the Mahabharata, the famous Indian epic, that states, Treat others as thou wouldest thyself be treated, and do nothing to thy neighbor, which hereafter thou wouldest not have thy neighbor do to thee. Our goal in life is to experience union with God and all beings. We can make this end the means of realizing God. If we practice trying to see the unity, if we do unto others as we would have them do unto us, our consciousness will eventually be transformed. Then we will actually see the one God vibrating in every atom of the universe and love him in all beings. Teaching Arjuna the truth of universal love, Sri Krishna said, Who burns with the bliss and suffers the sorrow of every creature within his own heart, making his own each bliss and each sorrow? Him I hold highest of all the yogis. There are some who believe that the search for God is apt to make the searcher indifferent to the sufferings of others. But the very opposite is true. For the more we turn to God with love, the more sensitive we become to the problems of others, and the more we care for them. We begin to realize that our own self is the self in everyone else. Because we wish to be happy, we cannot cause unhappiness to others and so we cannot hurt others in any way. My master Swami Brahmananda used to say, Go and meditate, chant the Lord's name. Then you will find your heart expanding in sympathy for all.
Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus warns us that realization of God is not easy. Purity of heart can only be achieved after a great struggle. In the Katha Upanishad we read, Like the sharp edge of a razor, the sages say, is this path. Narrow it is, and difficult to tread. We are also told that the Lord created the senses outgoing. Accordingly, man looks toward what is without and sees not what is within, it states. And further, rare is he who, longing for immortality, shuts his eyes to what is without and beholds the self. The natural human tendency is to rush out through the broad ways of the senses and lose oneself in the world. The process of religious growth is to turn that whole current of life around and make it flow inward through the straight gate. The meaning of the straight gate seems to be made quite clear by the yoga teachings on spiritual awakening. The yogis of India identify three nerve passages in the spine, which are called the Ida, the Pingala, and the Sushumna. The Ida and the Pingala are the two outer passages of the spinal cord, but modern people who have studied anatomy have been unable to find any use for the Sushumna, the central passage. Yoga, however, reveals its use. According to the yoga teachings, there are seven centers of spiritual consciousness located along the spine in the human body. As the space of the spine, a reserve of latent spiritual energy is situated, which, awakened by spiritual practices and devotions to God, flows upward through the narrow channel of the shushuna. As this energy reaches the highest centers of consciousness, it produces various degrees of enlightenment. As long as the mind is attached to worldliness, consciousness dwells in the three lower centers, at the organs of evacuation and reproduction, and at the navel. The mind then contains no spiritual ideals or pure thoughts. The fourth center of consciousness is in the heart region. When the spiritual energy rises to this center, the aspirant sees a divine light and experiences ecstasy. As the energy reaches the fifth center at the throat, he wants to think and talk only of God. At the sixth center, between the eyebrows, he experiences the vision of God. There is still a slight sense of ego left there, and the aspirant longs to break down that last barrier of separation from God. When the spiritual energy bursts into the highest center in the brain, the realization dawns that I and my Father are one and perfect divine union is attained. So the Shashumna would be literally a narrow gate leading to eternal life, to the knowledge of God himself. In India, yoga teachings on the spiritual centers have been corroborated by the experiences of aspirants for thousands of years. But the mystical realization is, of course, not limited to India. It is the same for all whether they are Hindus or Christians, Jews or followers of any other religious path. For a striking resemblance to the experiences of Indian yogis, consider the example of Jacob Bohm, a Christian mystic of the 16th century, who describes in his confessions his own spiritual awakening. For the Holy Ghost will not be held in the sinful flesh, but rises up like a lightning flash, as fire sparkles and flashes out of a stone when a man strikes it. But when the flash is caught in the fountain of the heart, 
Then the Holy Spirit rises up in the seven unfolding fountain spirits into the brain like the dawning of the day, the morning redness. From this, God, I take my knowledge and from no other thing, neither will I know any other thing than that same God. Though an angel from heaven should tell this to me, yet for all that I could not believe it, much less lay hold on it, for I should always doubt whether it was certainly so or not. But the sun itself arises in my spirit, and therefore I am most sure of it. <laughs>